Today is Sunday, June 23. I'm Pastor Anthony, and this is a sermon edition of Wilderness Wanderings. Today we continue on in our series on the Sermon on the Mount, the final part of chapter 6 now. If you'd like to catch the full worship service, the sermon comes from, and I would invite you to do so because it includes testimonies from some of our young people as they made profession of faith. So if you'd like to check that out, YouTube link is down in the notes. But for now, may God bless you as you hear his word. Last weekend, the Sherman family, previous members here, got together to build a memorial bench for Karina in the community garden. Some of you may know and others may not, but uh, Karina, who died this past December, was instrumental in the founding and keeping of that community garden over here next to the church for the first number of years. A plaque on the bench now makes mention of this, but also offers a witness of faith to all those who might pass by. At the bottom, in italics, maybe too small for you to read, is a quote, something that Karina spoke and insisted on more often near the end of her life. She said, it isn't enough just to know about God. You must know God. I think Hannah echoed that sentiment exactly in her testimony earlier. And it flows underneath what the others shared as well. We learn about God in different places and ways across our lives, but knowing God is what faith is all about. That's what brings someone to the place of testimony. It is the relationship formed and grown in over the years. Because God is not just some dusty dusty doctrines or words on a page. If there is any reason that a church comes together to gather at all, it is because there is a real living God behind all of those words that animates all of our lives and our living. A God who calls to us and who gives us context to all of the commands, all of the ways He invites us to walk in. This is a God who loves us, but yet who is distinct from us in our ideas about Him. A God who is always mysteriously beyond us, and yet who has also made Himself known and knowable to us. And in the professions that we heard this morning, this sort of knowing is what we heard. Youth who have grown up in this church, who have come to know about God, yes, but who have also encountered others in this church and in their lives who have passed on something more, a living faith, a living hope, a knowing not just about God, but a knowing of God himself a living relationship with the living God who, he, who we know as Father. And he has invited us to call Him that. This was Megan sharing about how she was taught, taught to cultivate practices of time, of devotion and prayer that eventually left her longing to get to know God as her Father. It was Caleb telling how he caught his parents praying together and eventually heard that same God speaking to him. It was Hannah sharing how hard it was that her parents did not know the answers when Grandpa Pete got sick. But they did know God. And this God was their rock. And they told her to find in this God her rock. Because of that, they were going to be okay. And because of that, they turned to prayer, to speaking with this God. They started talking to the God that they could not see about the things they could only hope for. And in doing so, they passed on the faith. Do any of us know everything about our earthly fathers? Of course not. But if we are able to continue in relationship and conversations over a lifetime, we will slowly get to know them better. Never will we plumb all the mysteries of another person, but in relationship we can come to know them better. Their will their ways. It is the same with our Heavenly Father. Knowing Him does not mean that we know everything. We don't. What it does mean is that we are in relationship with one another. That phrase of the covenant, I will be your God, you will be my people. We are in relationship with one another. And relationships like other other living things may start small, but can grow. Can become strong and true like the oak tree and bear fruit over a lifetime. 
Jesus uses the word Father 12 times in chapter 6 of his Sermon on the Mount. One for each of the patriarchs, the fathers, the 12 tribes, these ones who carried and passed on Israel's faith, which was then passed on down through the generations of God's people until it arrived here before you today. A living faith passed down by fathers and mothers and other people living out the faith from one generation to another that called out to the next. And to remind you, in chapter 6, Jesus has stepped beyond the commands and the what-to-dos of chapter 5 into the hows and the whys. And the biggest why that we are given, the biggest motivation for following Jesus in obedience in His Sermon on the Mount is the Father who sees not only what is done in the secret places of our lives, but also who sees our needs and cares for them, cares for us. If you were here, and I recognize that some of you were not when we began chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount, I quoted, though, from uh, C.S. Lewis's essay, The Weight of Glory, at that time. Lewis and Jesus both talk about the reward of the Father who sees what is done in the secret place. Now, we aren't told by Jesus what that reward is, at least not directly. But Lewis thinks the reward on offer is nothing more than the Father himself. And Jesus does seem to imply the same. The Father is not just who our lives ought to point to and be lived for, but He Himself is also the reward of such a life. He is the treasure in heaven that we invest ourselves in. He, the, the prize is coming to know our God, to see Him at work in His workshop, feeding the birds, clothing the lilies in spring, and then turning to see us there standing in the doorway watching Him and waving us over with a bright smile for a hug and to show us more of the wonders and the beauty of all He has made and all He continues to do. In our heart of hearts, we long to belong. The Heidelberg Catechism picks that up in the first question and answer. This is our hope and comfort. Because we long to belong, to not be alone, to be at home, at rest, at peace, known for all that we are and all that we aren't, all that we have and all that we don't, and yet be loved and held and cared for all the same. And all this that we long for is exactly what our Heavenly Father gives. My goodness, He gives it in abundance to the sparrows and the clover. And are you not worth much more than they? Jesus' point in all this is to say, not only can we not serve competing masters, God and mammon, but the master that we do serve is good. He's not merely a master. He is a loving Heavenly Father who sees us, who cares for us, even more so than He does for the rest of His creation. Are you not much more valuable? And because this is our Father, Jesus can say, do not worry, friends. Seek first this one that you and your heart desires most, your Father. Seek His home and His kingdom. Seek His ways of righteousness. And everything else will come. Everything else will find its way. We have talked at length these past weeks about the deceitfulness of wealth and the problem of all our possessions, all our stuff. Pastor Michael called it rightly last week. Here, in this final section of the chapter, we simply attach all the anxieties that come with pursuing and securing all that stuff. Even the most basic and necessary of it. But I'm not going to rehash that whole problem too much here today. Because I think, on the whole, we can feel the anxiety-producing rat race of our modern lives well enough to know the problem that we face. The hollowness, the emptiness, the, 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 the running after that exhausts us. So instead, what I will do is I will pick up this picture of Solomon in all his splendor. Because I think what Jesus is referring to in this picture echoes with the larger point that he is making. 
so the story of Solomon. Maybe you recall it. King Solomon seems to be the shining example in the Old Testament of a faithful king who obeys God and who God then blesses with every blessing imaginable, more so than any person on earth ever had or will have. It's a true high watermark in the Old Testament, a splendor worthy of holding up as an ideal of what life looks like when we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Just think, Solomon builds the temple. He builds the palace of the forest of Lebanon. He receives 23 tons of gold annually and fine foods and drinks from all across the world to boot. Wealth and kings and nations pour into Jerusalem to see and to hear all that Solomon knows and has achieved. And all of this starts, we imagine, because when God reveals himself directly to Solomon, Solomon asks God for wisdom. A good request. Literally in the Hebrew, he asks for a hearing heart, a Shema heart that can do justice. God grants this. Solomon is seeking first God's kingdom and righteousness. And you know what? God gives him all the other stuff as well. The wealth, the honor, and a long life. We have to know that there is also a minor chord trilling in the background. Because actually the story of Solomon does not start with his request for wisdom, but with his alliance with the Pharaoh of Egypt after he has already cut off every threat to his throne. And that alliance with the Pharaoh of Egypt is sealed through a marriage to Pharaoh's daughter. What Solomon sought first was a very earthly and pragmatic security in the places the Israelites were told never to go again, Egypt. Only then, after that, do we hear of his love for the Lord and his request for wisdom. That theme continues throughout the story of Solomon. About midway through the story of this king, sandwiched between the story of the building of the temple, is one about the building of Solomon's own house, which was quite a bit bigger and more extravagant than God's. Solomon sought first his own kingdom, building up his own treasures on earth. And Solomon's house included not just a hall for that justice that he had asked to administer wisely, but also a hall for Pharaoh's daughter that was about the same size. Solomon quite literally built a house that was divided against itself in its loyalties. In order to build all the splendor that Solomon wished to build, he slowly turned God's people and the nations around him into slaves, like happened in Egypt. And as he accumulated these treasures on earth, slowly his heart was turned as well toward another master. With his wealth came many women, wives through treaties to secure his land and title, and wives for pleasure. Wives from the nations who brought other gods with them. And Solomon built houses for those gods too, and provided sacrifices for those gods too. In Proverbs and elsewhere in the Bible's wisdom literature, we hear that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Unfortunately, the fear of the Lord was never really a thing that Solomon sought first. His heart was always divided. And so despite all of his wisdom, he missed the most important thing, the first thing, the Lord his God. And his kingdom and splendor came crashing down. His son Rehoboam tried to double down on Solomon's Egyptian slave-driving ways and the ten tribes of Israel were torn out of his hand. First split of God's people in history. The rabbis say that Solomon was the worst king of Israel because he was the one who divided God's people. It was his failure to seek first the heavenly Father, his kingdom, and his righteousness that led to the 12 tribes being ripped apart into a northern and southern kingdom. So says Jesus, learn not just from the lilies, but from Solomon also. Solomon was the pagan that ran after all these things. The food, the drink, the clothing, the splendor, and the flowers of the field rebuke him. 
Solomon has passed and his kingdom is destroyed. But the flowers remain. They still bloom. Together in harmony with the rest of creation, content with their limits, content with what God has given them. All under their heavenly Father's good care. But more than that, in this sixth chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus names the Father twelve times, as I told you. One for each of the twelve tribes of Israel, who are again all present and accounted for, whole and united once again under one God and Father, because God was always the King. And His people are together in His kingdom, because in the Father's kingdom, they were never divided. Unlike Solomon, the invitation to us is to seek God first. Not to seek to secure our own kingdoms first, but the Father's, trusting that all that is needful will be added as well. After all, if God has cared for and preserved the sparrows and the lilies all these years, can He not do the same for you? So, do not worry. Seek simply and firstly the Father, His kingdom home. His ways of righteousness, trusting that all the rest will be given you as well. We go back to the beginning. Solomon knew about God, perhaps more about God than anyone who lived before him. But in the end, he did not know God. May it be different with each of you who has professed your faith this morning, and may it be different with each one of us here today. These words, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Dear people, God has claimed you as his very own. Seek him. Seek Him first. Seek Him always. And it will go well with you. I invite you to join me in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, what You ask of us is to trust You. To trust You firstly, deeply, and fully. You know all the things that we need. You know our anxieties, you know our worries, you know our fears about the things that we might not have enough of. You know what is and what is not in our bank account, what is and what is not in our fridge, what is and what is not in our hearts in terms of hope and trust in you. So Lord, we pray this morning that you, the God who has firstly given us every good gift, including our lives, our health, and this promise that you will be our God. May you, the God who has given up all, may you renew our faith, our hope, our love, our trust. May you enable us to seek you first, to not merely know about you, but to know you, to pursue you as our Heavenly Father in all things always. Firstly, that we might be content with what you give us, as we said in the profession of faith time, whether those things are joys or whether those things are sufferings, may you enable us to accept them all trustfully, knowing that you, the God who sees us and loves us, will care for us still. We entrust ourselves to you in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. And now, as you journey on into the week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.